right now. Action process. This webinar will be recorded for future reference and for sharing with colleagues in order to complete the necessary steps to connection. And my name is Leanne Weber. I'm the AVP of Communications at Scenic. And we'll start out and give you a little more information about Scenic and the BIG program. And then Sun will move on to um, some of the different um, terms that you need to know uh, and be aware of to reach, go through the process at, towards completion. Oh, what's going on? Scenic is a 501c3. We have a mission to advance education and research statewide. And we do that by providing a world-class network uh, that is essential for innovation, uh, growth and collaboration. Um, we are governed by our charter associates and uh, the K-12 system in California are one of those. So you have people that sit on the, on the scenic board. Um, and we are, of course, a nonprofit. We have over 8,000 plus miles of optical fiber in the state. And all of the 58 counties connect via fiber to Scenic's CalRun backbone. Over 12,000 sites connect. And we collaborate with over 750 private sector partners in the state. We have 25 plus years of connecting California as an R&E network. By using California, CalRAN broadband, scenic member institutions enjoy supremely reliable, efficient, and cost-effective access, as well as these benefits that are particularly applicable to you guys. Um, the unlimited broadband usage, there's no monthly data cap. Your network will be designed uh, uh, ex uniquely for your um, needs. So we have we bring the design expertise for your connection. We help with federal and state subsidies. So they're assisted, such as E-rate, and you um, get lower costs on circuits and, circuits and equipment by leveraging our high volume purchasing power. We have a little case study here for the K-12s. We know that online learning and testing was really one of the um, important needs that you have as one of our community uh, members. Um, and previously, uh, before you were connected to Cal CalRAN to, for the students to uh, participate with CAASP, some schools would only be able to test 20 students at a time or where they were un or unable to perform online testing at all. Um, now connected schools receive the same connection um, as the research and education universities to do. And the test is administered to about 600,000 students simultaneously. Um, that large amount of data is generated and it's transferred across Scenic's network to the testing servers without traversing the commercial internet, and it's treated the same as research data is. Um, to aid in the smooth testing experience, Scenic constantly monitors and upgrades its network, and it also provides high-touch support through highly skilled Scenic engineers. Uh, joining K-12 conference bridges to provide quicker resolution if there were testing issues that were occurring during that time. I'll now introduce you to Kim Lewis. She's our Director of Government Relations at Scenic, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about the K-12 broadband project. Good morning, and thank you, Leanne. Um, as we are all too aware, the pandemic has only further elevated the importance and need for robust broadband for our communities. We are extremely pleased to share with you additional information on year two of the state funded broadband infrastructure grant program, often referred to as big throughout this presentation. I'm also gonna cover a little bit of the history as well as what the big program dollars will be paying for. Just as a quick note, we will have some time at the end of the presentation to address any questions that may arise. So please feel free to add your questions in during the presentation in the Q&A or chat box as needed. Next slide. To date, we have awarded 30 sites 
during year one of the big program. And I am pleased to report that we've already had three year one sites complete the connection process and are using, utilizing their connection. As part of year two, which is why we're all here today and starting with you, we have 10 sites that will be proceeding this year. In total, 13 counties are participating in this program that we are working to bring robust fiber broadband to them in order to enable digital learning opportunities. Next slide. Now, for a little bit of a deeper dive on the program history, as well as a side-by-side -side comparison of BIG and its predecessor program, the Broadband Infrastructure Improvement Grant Program, which you may have heard about previously, this prior program, the Broadband Infrastructure Improvement Grant Program, was created under Governor Jerry Brown when the state of California moved to its online K-12 assessments. In the first year, the program was provided $27 million in funding, and the following year, based upon its initial success, um, additional funding was provided that almost doubled the program. This one was administered by our friends at the K-12 High Speed Network, who contracted with Scenic to support the implementation of the Broadband Infrastructure Improvement Grant Program. These connections were technology neutral, meaning they could have been fiber or a fixed wireless connection, as the goals of the program were different. It was focused on ensuring that all students were able to take their online test. Altogether, we had over 437 sites that were awardees, and we are just wrapping up the final stage um, with the remaining five sites to be connected. Now the big program, which is what we're all here for today, was created in 2019 as part of Governor Newsom's leadership to focus on broadband connections that were fiber-based or future-proof as some might say. And this is a priority issue area was present for the governor even before the pandemic. We have a total of 12.7 million for this project to identify schools lacking fiber broadband connections and to deliver reliable, scalable connections to them. Governor Newsom and the legislature are working to bring broadband for all to all of California. And this program really supports that vision. Next slide. With the big funds, we wanted to take a few moments to cover the benefits of participating in this program so your school, district, and county office of education can become familiar with the costs that will be covered by this program. For many schools lacking a fiber-based broadband connection, it is often the one-time cost of special construction that makes it prohibitive for a school. These expenses will be covered by the grant and E-rate subsidies. For site readiness costs, these are items such as space, power or other requirements that may need to be addressed before the circuit can be installed or get to that minimum point of entry location at your school site. For equipment, this could be a router or a switch. Knowing that the school does not currently have a fiber-based broadband connection, the program anticipates some level of equipment may be needed at the school site in order to receive the circuit. Further, some schools may not have technical staff to support the activities needed to integrate the service of the network, and these costs may be provided. As with broadband service, there are monthly bills for the cost of the circuit. The big program will pay for anywhere from six to 18 months of these recurring costs. This is a range of time as it really depends on the timing of the installation as the circuit, as well as ensuring that the transition or supersedure process aligns with the federal E-rate process. The big program looks to maximize federal subsidies available to schools through E-rate, or as formerly known as the Universal Services Fund, as well as the state's universal subsidy program for schools, known as the California Teleconnect Fund, or CTF. An exciting benefit of the federal rules, though, are that they will provide an enhanced match when state dollars are provided for this type of activity. I'm really hoping that everyone's familiar with both E-rate and CTF, so I won't touch on that here, but one of my colleagues will touch on that supersedure piece as noted. BIG is a one-time grant program, and so those ongoing recurring costs of services will need to be supported by the school site. Fortunately, Scenic will also be providing E-rate consultation to ensure that the cost borne by a school 
continues to maximize both subsidies through E-rate and CTF discounts. Next slide. While the big program will be providing a tremendous benefit and covering the cost of bringing fiber-based broadband to your school site, given the limited funding available for this program, we wanted to make note of other costs that could come up and may need to be considered for each site. As noted in the first bullet, and dependent upon the policies of your county or district, there may be additional costs in terms of annual or monthly fees for the ongoing support of that connection. Other equipment that your school may need to think about are things such as firewalls or local area network devices, think routers or wireless access points. Through some of our past experiences working con to connect our vast membership, we want to highlight that it's important to be very thorough and accurate with the information provided to us. For example, if a school later decides that they want to build a new server room and change the location of where the circuit will go, those change order costs will not be covered by the grant. Um, another example of this could be reconfiguration support for your local internal network needs. After the installation and integration of your circuit, Scenic will notify the service provider that your school site will be able to call them directly for support. Ongoing troubleshooting or dealing with outages will need to go directly to the service provider and we will make sure that you have all the information needed to do so. As noted, we just wanted to highlight some of these potential additional costs depending upon your local circumstances. So there is ample time for you to plan accordingly. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Sen. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sen Nguyen. I am the project manager for the BIG. Uh, I will go over what you have to do to get connected. So once awarded to receive the service, you will need to complete three things. First, you will need to sign a memorandum of understanding or MOU. By signing the MOU, you agree to pay a monthly recurring cost for the service after we transfer the contract to the school, like Kim said, which is typically from six to 18 months after the start of the service through a process known as super procedure. Second, you must complete the scenic survey. This survey will ask for your contact and site specific information. And third, you will need to communicate with us regularly uh, to, to schedule on site activities and to share projects updates. So there are six steps to get connect. First, we'll col collect site information through the survey mentioned in previous slide. Then we'll schedule a site survey to see if any make ready work need to be done. After that, we will work with you on technical planning and placing order with the carrier. Then we will collaborate for equipment delivery and room readiness construction if needed. Then we will start implementing once the circuit is delivered. After this, you can start using your new broadband connection. And the last step is the procedure. We will transfer the contract to you and you will be responsible for the service charge. Let's look into the procedure process. Uh, procedure process really is just only two things you need to do to supersede. First is file link for E-rate, typically by the end of March. And second is contact the service provider to transfer the contract from Scenic to your school. Uh, Cynic will reach out to you and also the service provider when it's time to start the super procedure process. The contract will be transferred by July 1st, approximately six to 18 months after the installation. Let's go to sum up the common question. And next one. I'm sorry. There you go. Um, okay. Uh, so we are actively looking to provide service for school that need fire based broadband assistance. So if you know any site with low or no network connectivity, please let us know. You can also go to the link in the chat to submit your application. Do we need to fill out anything to participate? It's very easy to participate in the grant. 
you only need to sign an MOU and take our BIG survey. When will I know my costs and how were those costs determined? The monthly service fee will be listed in the MOU. The rate is provided by carrier that bit on their RFP. Those are the common questions that we usually got asked. Uh, aside from that, does anyone have anything that we, do you have any other question for us? There is a question um, that is asked here. It says, can you give an example of BIG covering 18 months of service? Okay, so the SIP procedure normally is always start in the July 1st. So if any service that is installed after December 1st of the previous year, it will go into to the, not the next uh, July, but like the, the July after that, that will be uh, 18 months from the day of the installation. And anything prior to December 1st, say anything prior to December 1st of 2022 will supersede on July 1st of 2023. And anything after that will supersede on the July 1st of 2024. So if your circuit is installed on December 2nd of this year, you will have 18 month cover. And as we noted during the presentation, we really want to ensure that, that we're having seamless um, transition from scenic to the school site and ensuring that you're able to continue to access those E-rate funds. So it's really partly um, dependent upon that E-rate cycle that we have to follow so that you can continue to receive E-rate on the monthly discounts. Does anybody have any additional questions? You can put them in the chat. Um, or yeah, that's probably the easiest way. Okay, um, if nobody has any additional questions, you'll notice there's two links in, um, in the chat for you. Um, one is the big, big school eligibility survey, and we ask that you fill out that form so that uh, Sun and Dave Wills, our program managers, can get in touch with you. And the other is um, uh, the contact information for the two of them. And that's, I'm really having problems with the slides moving and I don't know why I'm really, I apologize. But those two links will be in the chat. This presentation has been recorded and we will be happy to um, uh, send forward to you if you've um, attended. You, there will be a download so you can rewatch it. And the presentation is also available. Thank you very much for taking the time and attending. And we look Actually, forward to participating. Uh, Leanne, we have another question. Um, uh, okay. In the chat, it says Should district encumber the full amount of the MRC or the undiscounted portion only? Should the district encumber the full amount of the MRC or the undiscounted portion only? Uh, Sherilyn, can you answer that question? Do you, is there a best practice for that? Ah, thank you, Sherry. Um, per the FCC requirements, you're obligated for the full MRC. So you would encumber the, the whole amount. Anything else? That's a great question. Thank you, Vern. Okay. You have the experts. This is your last chance. <laughs> or feel free to raise your hand and hit click the raise yeah. hand button and we can unmute you as well if that's easier. Yeah, if that's easier. No? Yeah. All right. Burns oh, raised his hand. Can you unmute him for us? Yeah, let me let me let me unmute him. There you go. You you're still muted, Vern, but you have taught you. Oh, can yourself. Vern, you said you were on the phone, so we need to unmute one of the phone lines. Are you the 
209 or the 559? 209. There you go. I should try it. You have, he has to unmute himself um, for the phone, but he's unmuted. Uh, See. I, we've done everything that we can do. Oh, there, there, you go. Go. there you go. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Howdy. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this information. I appreciate everyone's information on this. I, I just am um, going to be working with the school district to make sure that they jump through all the hoops. Um, I pretty much act as a liaison on behalf of the Merced River School District, who's getting this new service to the Washington Elementary School site. And so thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm just um, trying to get clarification. I know that some vendors, um, some service providers that provide the high-speed broadband services that are gonna be installed via fiber, uh, they typically um, do service level invoicing, SLI invoicing, to where they only uh, invoice the school district. At what point would we know whether the service provider for that school district uh, supports SLI or would we have to file a bare form? So, uh, Vern, this is Sherilyn Evans at Scenic. I'm the closest you have to an E-rate expert on the call. The FCC requires the school district to certify that they have the full funds to pay the full MRC if there were no funding available through the FCC for E-rate. And so that's why the school needs to encumber in the sense that they need to be prepared and they need when they sign their e-rate form 471 they're certifying that they have the funds to pay the full mrc what happens with most uh providers you're correct once you have uh, a history of being funded which you will get through the big program most service providers are willing to then deduct the applicable e-rate discount from your bill, from the school's bill, and, and this is what they refer to as SPI or SPI, uh, and they should be able to be invoiced the net amount rather than the gross amount from e-rate. Separate from that, there's also a CTF discount, which is half of whatever is left. And that typically is also uh, credited on the bill so that you get the, the net bill is usually the MRC minus E-rate and minus CTF discounts that the carrier will get directly from the federal and state government respectively. And I would say we want to avoid utilization of BEAR because the BEAR method actually makes you ineligible for the CTF discount. Gotcha. That, Sherilyn, thank you very much. That was perfectly, and, and you led right into my next question regarding CTF discounts and answered it as well. Thank you very much. That's all the questions that I have. Great. And then just to, to clarify what uh, Sun was saying in answer to your earlier question about uh, you know, we say you'll get anywhere from six to 18 months of uh, MRC paid for through BIG. And it's a reasonable question to want to know, is it going to be six or 18 months? Because there's a 12 month difference there. And the answer is that uh, in order for you to take over, that is in order for the school to take over ownership of the contract with the service provider, uh, we have to go through a supersedure process, which in essence is uh, transference of the customer of record. So at the time that we applied for E-rate, sorry, at the time that we went out to bid per FCC requirements, to be eligible for E-rate for this circuit for Washington school, 
we then subsequently applied for E-rate using the FCC's Form 471 on behalf of Washington School, but with Scenic serving as the customer of record for the circuit. And we're now, once the circuit is installed, we can then shift ownership of that circuit from Scenic to the school or school district, but the date on which we shift ownership from an E-rate perspective has to be on a fiscal boundary of July 1. And it has to go through the full E-rate process of uh, using our original Form 470 that we uh, published in 2021 uh, and 22 and the following on the Form 471 that we filed in March of 2022, theirs would be a renewal of the same uh, application starting in the July 1 following when they supersede. And so that means they would have to file a Form 471 the March prior to that July which means we'd have to do all of the transferring of contracts that uh, supersedure requires prior to March. And we feel that if a circuit comes in sometime late December or January, we won't have enough time to do the whole process by March in order to have the school file a form 471 in March and then take over ownership of the circuit by July. So for a school that gets a circuit installed, uh, we're typically saying by mid-December of the prior year, we probably wouldn't have enough time to get everything done for them to take over that circuit by July 1 and, and own payment on that circuit by July 1 and get E-rate. And we want them to get E-rate and CTF. So we're, we're conceding that if a circuit is installed in the same calendar year as the July 1 deadline, we're going to let them go another whole year. That, that, that makes sense. sense. It, yes, it does. That makes sense because it sounds like we just need a be able to complete the um, E-rate funding year before the school district can then take ownership for and apply for E-rate for the following funding year. So that, as you were mentioning, I think Sun was mentioning that as, it depends on when the service provider is able to install the service. So it sounds like the December 1st is the cutoff date. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. December 1st is the cutoff date. So if the service provider was to get it installed before December 1st, then the six months would apply if the the service provider was to install the service after December 2nd, then the 18 months or, or reduction of that would apply depending on when the service provider was able to get the service installed to allow the school district then take ownership of the service following a full complete E-rate year. Right, well, I, I think what Sun was trying to say is uh, if the circuit is installed before the month of December, it will supersede the following July. And if it's installed December 1st or later, uh, it would most likely not supersede the following July. It would supersede a year after the following July. And the reason he's saying if, it, if the circuit is installed in December rather than January is because there's, uh, we know there's a period of roughly two weeks that most schools are closed in December, second half of December because of the holiday. So again, we're, what we're trying to do is make sure that the school or the school district has sufficient time to work with us on the entire supersedure process such that they can uh, file a Form 471 in March, which is typically when the Form 471s are required. By, by the FCC. And we just don't think we have enough time 
in December, given the holiday, uh, you lose a lot of time in December. Um, so it, it, it's more likely that that would lapse for a year rather than supersede in July. Absolutely agree. December tends to be a very tight month to get anything from the districts <laughs> because of the holidays. So that's that's why he's saying the month of December. So so think of it as if the circuit gets installed between January and the end of November, they'll supersede the following July. in whatever uh, year they get installed. I do have one what if question. What if the service provider is not able to provide the service? And the only reason why I'm asking that question is we've been working with the Merced River School District and reaching out to the service provider that actually bid on this in the past, and they have never submitted a bid on this site. And so we've been trying to get any service provider in the past um, to replace the existing services. And I'm absolutely astonished, to be quite honest with you, that Scenic was able to get this. And so I am very pleased and looking forward to working with Scenic and the service provider, as well as the school district, to get this service installed. But is, has there ever been a, a situation to where the service provider has not been able to provide the service by any chance? And what would be the scenario for that? Yes, yeah, so you know the answer is that unfortunately, we do sometimes have that happen. And it's because when they respond to our bid, the service providers are doing what we refer to as a desktop design. They're going into their databases and looking at where they have infrastructure and seeing that we could do this and this, and then we could get to that school, except their documentation isn't precisely accurate or they find uh, problems that they didn't know existed that weren't in their documentation that they only find when they go out into the field. Depending on the provider, we, because we are scenic, because we have the statewide network for which we buy a lot of circuits, uh, there have been cases, and, and the case that comes to mind is uh, up in Humboldt County, uh, Greenpoint Elementary, I think it's called. The road that they were going to use for right of way doesn't exist anymore. And they had to redesign the path completely. It's now a, a big field that belongs to somebody. And so trying to get across this area of pri now private property that used to be a road uh, at one residents, they were actually told by the guy, go away, don't ever come back in a very forceful and threatening manner. And so they were ready to give up on getting to the school. And uh, we met with, uh, at the executive level, I met with a vice president with whom I'm colleagues, and we advocated strongly for this very rural school that had been unserved for a very long time. And they actually spent more money than they charged us to complete the build to that school and meet their commitment to Scenic. So there are times when we can convince a provider that they should stick with it and they should get that school connected, even though they've met obstacles they didn't expect. In other cases, it is uh, there have been a few times where uh, the provider has withdrawn their bid. And then frankly, we are faced with going out to bid again the following year and trying to find someone else who is willing to do that build. But the, the advantage of BIG is that the state allocated sufficient funds to BIG to pay the high one-time cost of building fiber. And sometimes when schools put out form, uh, go out to bid for uh, getting a connection to their school, providers look at that and say, there's no way the school has 
even the 10% amount that they have to pay for the one-time costs. So they don't bid. And they know that we do have the funds to pay the one-time costs. So uh, we're hopeful that you that we will be successful with Washington. I, I'm very hopeful as well. And just one over, one more note that I, I that was shared with me prior to the call is that the service provider that will be providing the service or that was contracted by Phoenix to provide the service did not include any special construction for this uh, service and only just the MRC. So again, I, I'm a little bit shocked and amazed, but I, I'm hopeful and optimistic about the project. We really appreciate you flagging that for us. And we do know that there's a lot of providers um, who have been working to um, you know, expand their footprints and build plans, just given the amount of resources available in the state for broadband deployment and, and work. So we really hope that they have um, put forward a really thoughtful proposal that can be successful. And we'll keep working with you and keep you abreast of the progress. Yeah, we, we really look forward to working with you, Vern. Same here, thank you very much. Thank you for taking my questions. Of course, great questions. All right, if we have no further questions at this time, I didn't see any additional hands raised. Just want to say thank you everyone for participating today and we will look forward to working with you thank in the you year ahead. Well. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.